I welcome you back to this study on a living sacrifice, and this particular section of lessons is on the uh, legalism, and we're looking today at some specific practices that are long-standing of the church, church beliefs, traditional beliefs, that are often under attack today as being legalistic, and let's explore them and apply what we've learned from the Bible to see if indeed they're legalistic or if they're Bible principles. So uh, thank you for being here, and let's have a little prayer before we get into the Bible. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for each person who has taken the time to study with us as we look into your word about this issue of of, uh, bondage and living in bondage because of legalistic practices and beliefs. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to discover all you would have us to, that we could be free to serve you with joy and passion. And we would be yielding to you, dying to self each day, that your will could be done in our lives. Thank you again for our study. Lord, help us to listen and Be alert to the Holy Spirit's teaching. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. There are many examples of legalistic practices that are referred to as being legalistic that are really just long-standing beliefs and practices that are in today's world, viewed as man-made and as legalistic. Yet some of them are just Bible, and many of them are. Now, as we said, the condition of the heart and the way our heart is in regard to keeping rules and laws is the key. And Christ came to set us free. And one of the things that I am learning from this study is that it's not so much what we're giving up because we can be worldly and and so disciplined that we're going to give up what the world's doing and not do it, but almost be jealous of those that are doing it. And that kind of defeats the purpose because... We're doing things to please God when we're being true believers. And so that's kind of the way we're going to look at things. And I want to start off, or, or next anyway, I want to read the um, first verse in the fifth chapter of Galatians and talk about that a little bit. If you have your Bibles, Galatians, the fifth chapter, and we're going to go back over the first verse. Galatians 5, 1, Paul writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not, let me get this next page, these little thin pages, goes along with the kind of Bible I like (laughs) And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. If there's a verse that reflects what I have learned and am still learning, is that one. We are free to serve Christ. So so many times we hear about somebody referring to freedom and we interpret it as we can do anything we want to do. Well, I guess there's a certain element of that's true if if the to do or your your want to is controlled by the Holy Spirit, and it just came to my mind. But it's further in the lesson. The key to living a, a living sacrifice is by walking in the Spirit, living for Jesus by walking in the Spirit. But the great thing I want us to get a a real handle on is how much fun, what joy we get. It may not be laughing fun, but it's a joy in our heart and a contentment in our heart, 
knowing that what we're doing is pleasing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one that died and paid the price for the penalty of our sins. To me, that just outweighs anything. And when we think about what we're giving up about the joys of this world, and you compare that to being uh, joyful because of doing something or not doing something that pleases Jesus, we just need to please Jesus and say hallelujah. And by doing that, our feelings toward those people who are perhaps sinning by doing things that are not pleasing to Jesus, we're not going to despise them like we probably do because we're not going to be jealous of them. We can think, well, they, if anything, they can be jealous of us because we've got the joy of the Lord in our hearts and in our souls. And the, what they're doing, they might say they're enjoying, but it's, it's short term. And the treasures that we lay up in heaven will be there for eternity. And that, what a wonderful thing, what a wonderful blessing that we have to live in the freedom of Christ. But Paul warns us, now that you've experienced freedom and you know how much joy you get from pleasing Jesus, don't fall back into this rule-keeping stuff. Rule keeping often is so you can keep track of what the other person's doing and keep score. But not thinking that, hey, they're probably keeping score on you too. Our heart is what it does. Our heart's what it's about. Now in the Old Testament, God was showing mankind that we needed a savior. He was showing us that we were not able to live the kind of life that he wants us to live on our own. And I believe that the Old Testament did that. Although a lot of people still didn't believe, but it was certainly demonstrated. We needed a Savior, and he had that plan already in place. Jesus was coming. And uh, we know that Jesus came, and we believe in him and our joy is in fulfilling what he wants us to do to please him. I, I just, I think about Jesus smiling and having that content look on his face when I've done something that I know he wanted me to do. I was faithful. I was obedient. And on the other hand, I think about how he must look when he's brokenhearted over what I've done <laughs> uh, or the uh, sheds a tear and I don't want that. I want him to smile. I want him to be content. I want him to say, well done, Mike. You've done what I wanted you to do in my strength, he would say. And I would say I yielded to the Holy Spirit. So God is good, and uh, he's an awesome God that we serve. The love of God is that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That's a key there. When we are a faithful follower of Christ, following and walking in the Holy Spirit means that our lives will reflect obedience to the commandments, but it won't be because we're trying to keep the commandments. It will be because we're pleasing Jesus. And that's a whole different approach that I really do like. Now let's get down to some real challenges. And this might, I hope it's not offensive to anybody, but it's on my heart and I, it's been on my heart for two or three weeks. And I've been kind of toying around with it, but I, I, the Lord gave it to me. So uh, this is not meant to be judgmental of anybody. If anybody, it's me that I'm judging. But let's get to some real challenges in those areas that range from being very clear to kind of in a gray area to a matter of black and white. Very clear. It's either sin or it's not sin. It's either in obedience to God or in disobedience to God. Things that we're about to talk to are things that can cause hurt within a church. It can cause hurt between brothers and sisters. And it can cause hurt between any 
relationships that we might have. Often, just because of the differences in views, the hurt may be unintentional, yet it is still hurt. And as Christians, we need to be able to deal with hurt. But I'll confess with you, I I used to think that was something that I was pretty uh, good at. But the Lord showed me I wasn't very good at uh, at being hurt, nor seeing family members hurt. <clears throat> but here's some topics. What about marriage? What about marriage? Is the way we interpret what the Bible says, is that because we want to be legalistic? Or... Do we interpret the Bible loosely because we want to say anything is all right? We're going to spend some time seeing what the Bible says about that. Related to that is what about the family? There's a term traditional family. And to me, it's very clear what a traditional family is. But in today's world, it's so mixed up, it's kind of hard to to really identify traditional families. They do kind of stand out when you have one. But a family can be within God's approval without being the checking off all the little lists that items that we might have to say this is a perfect family. A perfect family is not necessarily made up of perfect individuals. And it's a matter of who is on the throne, and that's God. What about church? Church is changing a lot. It has changed a lot. And yet there's some that haven't changed. Uh, what is the church supposed to be like? And we studied that in the Bible. But we also practice church each week, two or three times a week sometimes. And the church life, what is it to be? Does that reflect that traditional family and marriage? What about equality? We're all born equal. That's a, that's a state of, a status that we, uh, agree to in our country. What does that mean? Does that mean we're all the same? So let's look at this concept of what about equality and sameness? Or how do they relate? And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in some scripture. So let's look at some key verses in the life of a believer and the life of the New Testament church. What is that verse? It's one that you've heard me say several times, even in this series. First John 1, 9. Tell me what that's talking about. It's talking about forgiveness. We can have a relationship with God, and He sees our completeness in the future. Yet we're on this earth, living the life on this earth, with a sweet fellowship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But when we sin, what does that do between between Mike and Jesus? He's still my Lord and Savior. He's paid the price for all of my sins. But what kind, what does that do to our fellowship? It damages it. It sometimes cuts it off. But Jesus doesn't quit loving us. He loves us. He's disappointed in our sin. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit convicts us, and is always, he's always drawing us to Jesus. So we may have sinned and not thought much about it, and all of a sudden, for the next day or two, we're miserable. Why am I miserable? Oh, I think I know. I don't feel close to Jesus like I usually do. I don't have that fellowship. So the Holy Spirit leads me to say, Jesus, I miss you. I miss you being so close to me. I know now that I sinned. I knew I sinned when I did it, but I just 
and won't think about it. But I want to have full fellowship with you. I'm not going to do that anymore, and please forgive me. And First John 1, 9 says he's ready. He's anxious. He's waiting for us to say that. And he will promise, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. When we confess to him that we sin and we don't want to do it anymore. He forgives us of that sin, not to keep us out of hell. We're already there. We're with him. But to restore our fellowship, our closeness with him. And then we are more sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So we remember that God looks on the heart and that we look on the exterior. So in all this, let's remember that God is looking on the, on the interior. He looks at what we really mean. Why are we doing what we're doing? He looks on the heart. And we're not able to do that. As far as I'm concerned, if it was not for God's love wrapped up in his grace and his mercy, I would have no hope. What does that say about how good my works are? It says they are nothing. Because my way of being saved, my relationship with God, is because of his love for me. Yet while I was a sinner, Jesus died for me. And yet, here I am, unworthy as can be. But God's great grace and mercy, that's how I can have eternal life. I should spend the rest of my life on this earth and even after being thankful and praising God for the way he provided for this man, Mike, to be saved and have every, everlasting life. And not only me, but every other person that's born in the world. He desires for no one to be lost, but for everybody to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whosoever. And we as, as individual Christians and as churches need to remember whosoever. What can I brag about? As far as for Mike, when I'm looking at my salvation as being totally bought and paid for and executed by God, I have no room to brag except on him. And our way of doing that is lifting up Jesus Christ. Anything, now you might think, well, what does all that have to do with, with legalism? This is what it has to do with. If I spend my time bringing attention to myself, giving indications that look what I have done, and look what God gave me for what I did, that's legalism in the, in the worst case. Because I'm not relying on God, I'm relying on myself, and I'm not shining the light on Him, I'm asking everybody else to shine the light on me. Lord, help us and help me. If I've done that, I certainly don't need to. It's pitiful.